this year. Yes, so I would like to welcome you all uh, to the first online seminar uh, for this year. And the second one uh, that's uh, from the project of the Department of International Relations in the National Research University Higher School of Economics uh, and the International Laboratory on World Order Studies and New Regionalism and the Bulgarian Club in our university, the European integration, uh, the Eastern European aspect uh, that is supervised by Professor Alexander Lukin, uh, where in few lectures, we will try to present the most pressing issues of the European Union. My name is Stefan Stianov, and I'm, I'm the vice chairman of the Bulgarian Club, and I'm going to be uh, your host today. Uh, our subject, we're going to talk about the European Union and NATO, and frankly, we're talking about it a little bit later. Uh, uh, you, I don't, I don't think that we could, we, we could have chosen a better time to hold this meeting uh, because on the one hand, uh, France took over the presidency of the Council of the European Union. And we, and we all know that France is uh, one of the countries that, um, that is most committed uh, to continuing European security integration. And on the other hand, uh, we're witnessing something that, um, uh, that our uh, scientific uh, director of the program, uh, Fyodor Lukianov, called uh, ne negotiation marathon uh, between the United States and Russia, between NATO and Russia. Um, uh, uh, and it, it, um, it is becoming increasingly important not only to talk about security policy, but also to understand the, uh, the meaning of it and how to uh, realize it in this uh, I would say very, very complicated international atmosphere. And in this line of thought, I'm very happy that our, uh, that today's lecture is someone who actually studied in Moscow and in Western Europe as well. Someone who understands the approaches of uh, both sides. Uh, the chairman of the Sofia Security Forum, uh, Yordan Bujilov. Uh, as I already mentioned before, he, graduated from the Faculty of Philosophy of uh, Moscow State University, Lomonosov, and held and holds a master's degree in uh, philosophy and political science, and also a master's degree in law from the University of National and World Economy in Sofia. He specializes in international relations and security policy at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany, and the Geneva Center for Security Policy in Switzerland. He began his career at the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Bulgaria in 1992, holding various expert and managerial positions, including head of the uh, Chancellor, Chancellery Department, head of the International Organizations and Arms Control Department, director of the International Cooperation Department, uh, deputy director of the Department of uh, Security and Defense Policy, and also served as head of the political cabinet of the Minister of Defense. He has led the negotiations team uh, for a number of international agreements and chaired the board of the RACVIAC uh, Security Cooperation Center in uh, Zagreb, Croatia. And uh, uh, let's not waste more time. I'm very happy uh, to give the floor to our lecturer. And I remind you that you can uh, write your questions down and or ask them after uh, uh, after the lecture. So I think you can unmute, yes. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Благодаря, Стефан. Спасибо, Стефан, за хорошие слова и за представление. Я действительно учился в Московском университете 30 лет тому назад. Я закончил в 1991 году. Очень-очень давно. Uh, once again, thank you for your kind words uh, and, uh, and the presentation. And indeed, uh, it's um, a very timely discussion. Uh, as uh, we all see what, uh, what is happening now, uh, especially nowadays uh, with uh, negotiations uh, and talks uh, in the Russia-US uh, uh, bilateral talks, uh, Russia-NATO uh, Council. Uh, we we also have uh, discussions uh, in the framework of uh, the OSCE, and all all these uh, talks and negotiations are not only about uh, the current situation uh, in Ukraine, 
It's not uh, about the current security issues, but it is also about uh, uh, the security architecture uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it is uh, about uh, visions, it is about principles, and it is uh, also about uh, how, how different countries uh, see their security. So uh, first of all, uh, I, I welcome I welcome this approach because uh, only through negotiations, only sitting uh, on the uh, negotiation table, uh, we can uh, uh, reach uh, commonly acceptable results. So let's let's hope uh, that uh, we'll see we'll see progress. Um, when when we started uh, our communications uh, with Stefan, we agreed that. Uh, I will make a brief uh, presentation uh, on the topic of relations between uh, NATO and European Union. Uh, and if there is uh, complementarity of uh, if there is a competition between uh, both organizations. So let me let me start uh, first uh, with uh, uh, outline, outlining the, the main uh, priorities uh, and uh, principles uh, and the main tasks of uh, NATO and EU, uh, especially in the sphere of security. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, we'll go to the Q&A session. So uh, first, uh, first uh, I would like to say that uh, NATO and EU, of course, are different organizations. Uh, although they, they, uh, they do have very, very much in common. Uh, and first is that both organizations uh, are organizations of states, uh, um, which is uh, based on the principles of liberal democracy. And the criteria of membership uh, in both organizations are very similar. So countries have to fulfill some criteria, mainly in the spheres of uh, democracy, uh, human rights, uh, supremacy of law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And secondly, Many countries uh, are members of uh, both uh, EU and NATO at the same time. But again, uh, uh, NATO and EU are uh, different organizations with uh, uh, different uh, tasks, uh, different principles of uh, functioning. Uh, let me go uh, first uh, mm, uh, through NATO and uh, let me share some, some ideas uh, with you. NATO is an organization which uh, primary goal, primary goal is to ensure the security and I'll stress on it, defense of member states. This is, this is the first priority of NATO. Of course, NATO has three, uh, three main functions, uh, which are set uh, in, uh, in uh, the main documents. And it is collective defense, as I said, but it is also crisis management and cooperative security. So it's uh, three main tasks of NATO. At the heart, uh, at the heart of, of the alliance is the defense collective, uh, collective defense clause. Uh, uh, it is so-called uh, Article 5 of uh, NATO Treaty of, or Washington Treaty, which means uh, that uh, if one country is attacked, this attack is considered to be an attack on everyone else within NATO. In addition, NATO countries cooperate and exchange information on a wide range of security issues uh, uh, under uh, Article 4 of uh, the NATO Treaty. NATO, of course, it is union of independent states. Each state has equal right, and which is very important for NATO. There is no transfer of sovereignty. Decisions in NATO are made by collective bodies in which each country has an equal voice. Uh, you, you probably uh, know there are uh, different bodies within NATO, both military, civilian, uh, which are uh, given different, different tasks. But again, decisions, main decisions are made by countries. Now, I'm, I stress on this uh, because sometimes um, when I read articles in, uh, in Bulgarian or uh, international media, 
there is uh, sometimes perception that NATO, NATO is imposing decisions or NATO is imposing something on member states. There is no such thing in NATO. If something uh, is decided, it is decided collectively by all member states. And it is uh, actually one of the differences between uh, NATO and European Union. The key, key issue for, 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 for NATO, it is the transatlantic link between Europe and the United States. It is of key importance for NATO and mainly for uh, NATO uh, defense capabilities as United States provides key, key defense capabilities to NATO. You, 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 I'm sure you know that NATO has no armed forces. Uh, the armed, so-called NATO's armed forces, it's uh, armed forces of individual countries. So stronger uh, countries are militarily. This means that NATO is, uh, is, uh, is stronger. And each country commits to NATO uh, specific capabilities. I'm not going to discuss uh, the NATO defense uh, planning process, creation of capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will only mention that all countries uh, in NATO agreed that uh, they should increase their investment in order to create uh, new, new military capabilities in order to cope with all risks and threats uh, dependless, uh, dependless uh, where they come from. So NATO, NATO is uh, committed as an organization to cope with all risks and threats which NATO countries uh, face. So uh, uh, to cope with current risks and threats, and uh, they are quite diverse, uh, the question of uh, creating uh, capabilities uh, is of course a crucial one for NATO. Uh, actually, uh, as I said, uh, all countries pledged uh, to, to invest in their defense forces in order to increase NATO uh, common capabilities. And there is a so-called so uh, uh, understanding on our agreement between member states to invest at least 2% of uh, GDP for defense. Uh, only seven or eight countries currently uh, keep to this uh, pledge. Uh, Bulgaria, for example, is investing uh, about 1.6% uh, in defense budget. Germany is investing 1.1%. Mainly countries uh, uh, which face, uh, according to their estimations, which face uh, uh, substantial risks and threats like Baltic countries, Poland, Romania, they invest 2% uh, in their defense uh, budget, uh, France, uh, and uh, of course, uh, United States. But most of the countries, uh, they are uh, well below uh, the 2% the, the, the pledge. Uh, I said NATO, NATO uh, is committed uh, to protect countries uh, and um, NATO tries to address all risks and threats according to the common understanding and then, uh, of course, risk assessment of each individual country. What are the risks NATO is facing today? Uh, as, I, as I said, uh, there are many risks. That's why NATO uh, uh, adopted such so-called uh, 360 degrees approach. So NATO is looking to all possible risks and threats uh, uh, which may come from uh, different uh, countries or organizations or non-state actors, uh, terrorist organizations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is very, very difficult again to predict where, uh, where the, the, the threat uh, can come from. Uh, uh, and of, of course, uh, of course uh, uh, to, to cope uh, with uh, this full spectrum of, uh, of risks and threats, uh, NATO first uh, has to have 
uh, understanding about this, uh, this, this risk. And of course, to be prepared to have tools uh, to, address, uh, to, to address them. Uh, uh, and very important for NATO and the NATO's approach uh, to the risks and threats, it is building resilience. So because we don't know uh, where the next risk will, will come from, we, we have to be ready and we have to protect critical infrastructure to protect uh, uh, and to, 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 to assure uh, that, our, uh, uh, that our economies, that our societies will be able uh, to cope uh, with, with this, uh, this threat. Um, if you take, uh, again, NATO documents, you will see that uh, NATO speaks of uh, different types uh, uh, of, of, of risk and threats. Uh, of course, uh, at the first place, it is conventional risk and threats. Uh, or, other, or in other words, uh, it is risks uh, of conventional war. It is risks to the territories. This is risks which mainly NATO countries uh, will uh, counter uh, by uh, conventional means. Undoubtedly, uh, this is also a matter of, uh, of defense. Uh, and uh, of course, it is a matter uh, of uh, defense against possible military aggression by Russia. And this is, uh, this is why we have uh, these consultations uh, and negotiations uh, taking place uh, right, right, right now. Uh, but NATO is addressing uh, issues related uh, not only to conventional threats. NATO, uh, NATO is uh, committed as an organization to address risks uh, of, uh, let's say, terrorism, or different hybrid threats uh, or cyber, cyber threats. Uh, we, we often call this uh, asymmetric, uh, asymmetric threats. Uh, NATO, uh, NATO is committed uh, to uh, provide forces uh, or try to solve uh, uh, different uh, conflicts uh, in, in different uh, regions, which might which might affect uh, its member states. So instability in uh, different regions uh, in the world uh, and possible impact of this uh, uh, instability on member states, it is in the agenda of, of NATO. Um, we can uh, probably later talk about uh, Afghanistan uh, or, or Syria or uh, uh, operate NATO operations in the Mediterranean against uh, piracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, again, it is uh, uh, in the NATO agenda. Um, uh, for example, COVID. COVID uh, is also uh, a security risks, which NATO countries uh, often discuss. Uh, and mainly they discuss how to cope and how to assist uh, member, uh, member countries. Uh, NATO is uh, discussing also, let's say, future risks, uh, which can come from new technologies uh, like artificial intelligence, quantum computers, um, or uh, uh, robots, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So NATO wants to have a vision, what might be risks to its uh, member states. Uh, recently, China became uh, an issue uh, uh, for, for debates uh, in, uh, in NATO. Now, China is not considered to be um, uh, a threat, but rather a challenge. And uh, of course, having in mind uh, uh, the competition between the United States and China, NATO also tries to position uh, itself to, to find what, to find out what policies, uh, uh, what decisions, uh, NATO should probably take uh, uh, in the future with relations uh, uh, to China. Uh, I think I mentioned already uh, the terrorism, but uh, again, protecting uh, member countries uh, from terrorist attacks is, uh, of course, one, one of uh, the most important uh, tasks of NATO. Um, what, what the in 
what else? For example, uh, in NATO's agenda, uh, if you go uh, through the documents, you will see that uh, NATO countries are discussing space uh, uh, and security uh, in space, exploration uh, of states, as uh, more and more activities uh, are related uh, to, the, to, the, to the space exploration. Uh, climate change. Climate change as a security threat uh, is also uh, a new topic uh, on, on, on the NATO's agenda. Uh, and uh, you will see that uh, on uh, many, uh, many uh, NATO fora, uh, the climate change uh, comes again and again, because climate change uh, uh, causes uh, uh, risks uh, in different regions. We call it also uh, secu security multiplier. Uh, due to climate change, uh, uh, we will probably see uh, intensified competition for resources. Uh, there might be regional conflicts spurred by, by climate change. Uh, and of course, NATO is thinking uh, how to operate in different, uh, uh, in different uh, climate uh, situations. Uh, and uh, uh, one, one of uh, the newest uh, probably approaches of NATO is how to reduce uh, NATO's uh, footprint or uh, impact uh, from NATO's activities uh, on climate. So as you see, NATO has very, very broad agenda. It's uh, not only about uh, Russia, uh, as, uh, as many uh, would like to present it, no. Uh, it is about protecting uh, member states uh, from different types of uh, risks. Uh, again, NATO's main goal, it is to provide reliable protection and defense on the member, member countries. Uh, NATO does not commit uh, uh, to help uh, uh, or to provide defense to any other countries, even, even to partner countries uh, or countries uh, which are aspiring uh, for NATO uh, membership. So again, it is, uh, it is very key, uh, especially in, in the current uh, situation. NATO is collective defense organizations, but only for the members, uh, uh, for, the, for the current, current members. <coughs> one, one of the issues which is, uh, of course, important uh, today, uh, nowadays, uh, let's say, and uh, it will be uh, also in the discussion on different uh, uh, consultations and negotiations, uh, it is about NATO's enlargement. Uh, NATO enlargement is a key, uh, key policy and key principle of NATO. Uh, and I don't think uh, that uh, uh, will, NATO will give up uh, this, this principle. So, uh, the idea is that each country, each country, each sovereign country can take sovereign decision to be part of NATO or not. And NATO as an organization would agree to accept or not accept the country which aspires for membership. So this is uh, this is let's say uh, about NATO. Let me let me um, have a brief look uh, at uh, European Union. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. The 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 European Union's objectives are mainly to bring member states closer together in all sectors. It is economy, it's trade, it's social sphere, it's transport, finance, uh, human rights, um, rule of law, uh, principle of democracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the main idea uh, of, of the union is, uh, uh, to, 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 to assist its members uh, uh, to get closely together in order to increase uh, the, the, the cooperation. Of course, uh, you, you, you know the principles of free trade, uh, free transport, free movement, uh, uh, every, everything is, uh, is, is here. Uh, 
European Union has a huge leverage uh, to bring member states closer in all spheres. And it is, of course, the union's budget. And it's different, of course, from the, uh, uh, from the NATO's approach. As I said, in NATO, we have mainly uh, uh, countries' responsibilities to invest in their defense, and uh, after that, to submit uh, uh, military or other assets uh, for NATO's uh, operations uh, and missions. But uh, in the EU, we, we have a, send, uh, a, a new budget uh, which comes uh, from the uh, contributions of EU member states. And after that, this EU budget is uh, uh, spread uh, towards uh, uh, different, different, uh, different countries in order to support, again, uh, uh, different spheres. For example, I, uh, I, I'll tell you that uh, uh, Bulgarian contribution in common EU budget, it's about 0 0.5 billion euro or 500 million euro, which is equal to 0.9% of Bulgarian um, uh, economy or GDP. But from the EU budget, every year, Bulgaria received uh, more than 2 billion euro, which is almost equal to 4% of, uh, of, of Bulgarian economy. So uh, it is quite a substantial amount uh, which comes uh, from, from EU uh, uh, and uh, which is used by Bulgaria uh, mainly in the agri for the development of the agriculture sector, but also transport, uh, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. Um, what is also important? Countries give to the common EU bodies, common EU structures, uh, uh, part of their national sovereignty, which is uh, uh, which uh, uh, NATO member countries does not transfer to the NATO bodies. As I said, in NATO, all decisions are taken uh, unanimously by countries, but in the European Union. Uh, uh, countries give part of their sovereignty and transfer some authorities to the common bodies. Some uh, decisions of EU bodies uh, have direct effect on uh, member countries, uh, but uh, some of uh, the, 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 the decision taken by uh, Commission, Parliament and the European Council, they have to be uh, uh, implemented through uh, uh, national legislation. Uh, anyway, again, uh, European, European Union has uh, 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 more power to decide uh, uh, and countries have to implement decisions of uh, common, uh, common bodies. You probably heard about it. Primary and secondary legislation of European Union, it's European treaties and uh, later uh, adopted uh, regulations and different decisions uh, by, by uh, competent bodies. Again, European Union is not a defense union. It is primarily uh, 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 an union, I cannot say in an organization, but yeah, it is union of uh, uh, sovereign countries, uh, which, assist these countries uh, to, to better uh, develop uh, economically, politically, in uh, trade, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Having said that, I have to add that uh, uh, NATO, uh, 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 that the European Union is discussing uh, its role in international relations and its role, possible role, as security provider. So in the last year, European Union developed uh, uh, a lot of uh, bodies and uh, capabilities in order to, to be able to, uh, to, to contribute uh, to, to, uh, and work as a security provider. 
uh, uh, for example, uh, European Union created uh, so-called EU military staff, which can plan and execute uh, military operations. Uh, there are several policies uh, adopted uh, at the union level, like uh, permanent structure, uh, structure cooperation, uh, which aims uh, to develop military capabilities of the European Union. European Union Defense Fund uh, was created recently. So there are about 7 billion um, euros for the next uh, several years uh, uh, to develop co common uh, uh, military and crisis management capabilities. We have so-called coordinated annual review on defense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is, again, uh, the, the idea is that European Union should have some role in defense and security uh, of its member states or to provide uh, uh, security assistance uh, to different countries or different uh, regions. But again, defense is not the primary uh, goal of, uh, of uh, European Union. The, there is a mutual protection clause, uh, very, sim uh, very simple clause uh, in uh, uh, the Treaty of Functioning of uh, European Union, very similar to Article 5 of NATO. But the issue is that uh, European Union does not have uh, enough military capabilities to provide defense of its uh, members, as can NATO do. Uh, I, I, I think that Europe, European Union, is going uh, towards uh, development of uh, more capabilities. So European Union will be able, uh, in the future, to take more security responsibilities uh, on its own. Uh, having said that, a uh, few things are uh, important to me. <clears throat> uh, first, uh, to, to most of uh, uh, European countries, NATO remains uh, uh, a priority for European defense. Again, mainly because European countries uh, cannot provide necessary uh, defense and uh, military capabilities. Uh, and of course, uh, as I said at the very beginning, 21 countries are both members of NATO and members uh, of uh, uh, the European Union. It is crucial for Europe that transatlantic link uh, uh, functions uh, uh, and uh, uh, most of uh, European countries, of course, rely on, uh, uh, on uh, United States activities <coughs> in the protection uh, of uh, European security. Um, coming coming to, to, the, uh, to, to the topic of our discussion, uh, where is NATO and you uh, are competitors? The, the vision which is shared by uh, most of the European countries is that uh, uh, European Union has to be a pillar within NATO when it comes to defense, when it comes uh, uh, to defense of uh, European uh, countries. But European Union has to be able to act when NATO wanted to take a decision to act as an organization, or for example, United States wanted to be able or want to be willing to do some security uh, uh, work uh, uh, for, 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 for Europe. So it is very important uh, uh, to see uh, what European Union on, or, or what security uh, tasks European Union uh, would like to take on itself and what means European Union can, can uh, provide uh, for this. And this is the biggest, uh, the biggest discussion now. You probably know that uh, European Union started uh, almost uh, two years ago, a year and a half, so-called strategic compass, this is a process uh, which aims first at uh, analyzing the risks and security challenges for, for European countries, for the EU. 
So now countries are uh, discussing what, what are these uh, risks and threats. Second, uh, this is about the role of European Union as such in coping with these risks and threats. Um, there are, I would say, a lot of difficulties and differences um, in the assessment uh, of risks and threats between different European countries. Uh, clearly for Baltic countries, Poland, Romania, currently probably for uh, Finland uh, and Sweden, uh, this is a risk, uh, security risks coming from, uh, from Russia. For, for other countries like uh, France, uh, Spain and some others, it is risks and threats uh, uh, mainly, mainly caused by instability in African regions. So these countries would like to see European Union acting more uh, in the African continent. For countries like Bulgaria, Greece and some others, uh, the main risks are related uh, to migration, to instability in, uh, in the regions uh, in uh, close vicinity uh, to Europe. So uh, EU countries have to, to decide uh, about the role of uh, EU as a security provider. Uh, we expect that in March, when the strategic compass will be approved, we'll have this, uh, this clarity. And of course, uh, this strategic compass uh, will also guide European countries towards development of necessary defense capabilities. At the same time, almost in parallel with the EU strategic compass, NATO is preparing its new strategic uh, concept. So the first strategic uh, uh, concept uh, uh, or the previous, the, the previous strategic concept was approved in 2010, uh, and NATO now is uh, reconsidering again uh, risks and threats, and of course the role of NATO uh, in in coping uh, with these uh, risks and, and, and threats. Um, as uh, uh, both NATO and new member country, Bulgaria would like uh, to see. Uh, uh, these processes, uh, of course, uh, going uh, together. We don't want to see duplication between EU and NATO, uh, but mostly we would like to see more cooperation uh, between uh, uh, both organizations uh, so that uh, uh, they, they will, uh, of course, provide greater security uh, for, for uh, uh, mem member states. This is, uh, I think, uh, also an answer uh, to the topic of our conference. We don't want to see competition. We want to see complementarity and, of course, cohesion between Europe and NATO in the spheres of security and defense. I think that I will stop here uh, and probably uh, open the floor for Q and A's or comments. Again, everything is under discussion. Uh, uh, we, we still wait for more answers from respective bodies, from uh, uh, common structures of NATO and EU uh, to see what will be the vision. And of course, each country, including my country, Bulgaria, participates in all the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, I think, very informative and very interesting uh, speech. Now, uh, if someone has questions, you can raise your hand and okay, okay we already have questions. Um, so the first one I think is Martin. Yes, and thank you. Uh, can we have a moment to talk about potential misunderstanding or lack of cooperation between NATO members? For example, uh, the conflict between Turkey and Greece? And what does that mean to the unity of the organization? Thank you. Uh, we'll go uh, uh, question by question, or we'll collect some. I'm, I'm, yeah. Okay, let's 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 go. Uh, it is of course uh, um, one one of the biggest challenges uh, for NATO. Uh, of course, it is bilateral uh, bilateral uh, issue. It's a bilateral question. Uh, it has a long, long history. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it still persists. 
And it is not only an issue uh, between uh, uh, Turkey and uh, Greece, mm, mm, uh, because, because uh, it sometimes affects uh, uh, NATO's common decisions. As I said, each, countries, each country uh, has uh, uh, full right uh, to participate uh, in, in all decisions. And, uh, uh, you know, having these disputes between uh, uh, Turkey and Greece, and having in mind that Greece is also part of European Union, uh, we see uh, in many uh, instances uh, when Turkey blocks blocks uh, the cooperation between NATO and European Union. And it is uh, partially, partially because of disputes uh, between Turkey and, uh, and Greece. What is, what is uh, uh, the most important in this dispute? First, uh, uh, not to allow uh, you know, this, this dispute to become an open uh, conflict. Uh, and of course, NATO and uh, NATO countries, key NATO countries, uh, uh, have a big role in, uh, in this. Uh, of course, again, it is bilateral, bil there are many bilateral issues, uh, uh, but uh, uh, NATO is, is trying uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to help both countries to solve it. So this is, this is the first uh, issue. First, not, uh, not, not to uh, uh, you know, come closer to a military conflict. A second, how to, how to prevent uh, this dispute uh, from hampering the decision-making uh, within NATO. Uh, it is, again, quite a challenging. Uh, uh, again, we, we see, uh, we see uh, Turkey blocking uh, for example, military cooperation between NATO and EU. Uh, European Union, by the way, uh, relies, uh, uh, according to the so-called Berlin Plus agreements, uh, on NATO military capabilities. So uh, in some cases, uh, it is agreed between European Union and NATO that if European Union decides to hold uh, operation, European Union can ask NATO to provide uh, some capabilities. Uh, for example, command and control systems, information, etc., etc., etc. And uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, cases when uh, Turkey's block uh, such such uh, cooperation. Uh, I do hope that uh, in in the future we uh, the, the 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 level of tension between both countries uh, will go down, uh, and of course, NATO. Uh, we will keep taking decision uh, in an unhampered um, uh, uh, way. Thank you very much. The next question is from uh, Georgi Ivanov. Right. Uh -huh. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, we are very grateful for this lecture. Um, it was very interesting. Um, I want to ask a question about the expansion of NATO and the European Union. Uh, hypothetically speaking, Ukraine joining in the European Union and NATO. Um, how can this affect the future international relations? And for example, how the relations between the NATO members and Russia uh, would be violated? and to, um, what could be expected in terms of uh, political or uh, military decisions from Russia in this case. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, it's a very, very, very hot issue now. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, uh, let me say that uh, according to European security structure, or European security architecture. Uh, each country uh, is, uh, has a, is an independent in its decision how to develop itself. So the decisions uh, of uh, countries are taken by, by, by the people uh, through respective uh, and authorized bodies. So no one country has to say, has to have a say 
on the development or other uh, on other uh, on other countries. Uh, in this in this case, uh, um, I, I believe uh, that uh, you know according to the principles again principles uh, established uh, in Helsinki Final Act or Paris uh, Charter of uh, 1990 allows countries to decide by themselves uh, uh, in which way of development to go. Uh, in this case, uh, any country any country can potentially uh, become a member of uh, EU or NATO uh, if they fulfill certain criteria. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, enlargement uh, policy is one of the key policies, not only uh, for NATO, but also for, for, uh, for the European Union. So again, uh, first, we have uh, we, we we have to have uh, a, a clear decision and clear willingness of individual independent countries to become member. Second, it is about processes uh, of uh, implementation of several, certain criteria, and the third, it is the decision of NATO or European Union to accept new member states. So for NATO, uh, we currently have several potential, let's say potential uh, members. Uh, first, it is uh, uh, Ukraine and Georgia. They already declared that they would like to become members of uh, NATO and European Union. Uh, they did a lot uh, of to implement uh, NATO criteria for, for NATO membership. Um, but what about, um, how to put it, willingness of NATO or readiness of NATO to, to adopt new member states? Um, uh, I don't think, I don't think that uh, it is feasible now. So within, within NATO, there is no uh, common vision that uh, NATO will accept new member states, at least in the close future. So from this perspective, yeah, Ukraine uh, and Georgia, they are applicant, they want to join, but uh, I don't think that NATO is ready to accept. But again, we have to, to stick to the principle. We have to keep this principle that uh, uh, each country will, will have, and, uh, will have the, 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 the ability to decide uh, for itself. Uh, interesting, very interesting issue about uh, Finland. Uh, you probably heard that uh, currently Prime Minister of Finland declared that uh, after um, you know all this development in, in Ukraine, Finland should reconsider its decision, or uh, he's, he even said that uh, uh, Finland should uh, consider moving much fastly uh, uh, towards uh, NATO membership. Whether, whether Finland will become, again, it would depend first on Finland uh, and second uh, on NATO. So this is about NATO enlargement, <clears throat> EU enlargement, the same principles. We have several countries uh, which uh, declared willingness to become EU members. They are moving closely uh, to this membership, fulfilling um, uh, criteria, so-called Copenhagen criteria. Uh, uh, currently, several countries are negotiating uh, for this membership, like, for example, Turkey. Turkey is, by the way, negotiating since eight, 80s. Uh, and I don't think that Turkey will become uh, a member of EU anytime soon. Unfortunately, uh, Bulgaria blocked uh, the process of starting negotiations of uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia, and by this also in Albania, because uh, uh, these this countries are still considered uh, as a package. Uh, but I do hope that uh, we'll start soon negotiations uh, with, uh, with uh, Albania and North Macedonia. And together with other Balkan countries, uh, uh, we'll have uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, we'll be closer to, to, to EU enlargement uh, uh, 
in in a close future. I can't say that it will come in one, 10, even 20 years, uh, but uh, membership uh, uh, is a quite a long process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we have a question from uh, Milan Stankovic. Thank you. I would like to ask uh, a question about the nature of NATO, uh, uh, the nature of the state within NATO. So the nature of NATO membership. As we know, states when they join NATO, they become uh, NATO members that uh, delegate some uh, uh, responsibility to uh, mutual institutions. Uh, but at the same time, they still have national interests. And uh, 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 the question is, if uh, we have uh, a NATO member that has its own national interest and prolong its national interests, say Turkey within, uh, outside its borders in Syria in uh, 2016, or uh, the US military troops outside its own borders and uh, actions that don't have actually some uh, uh, interactions with with NATO member states uh, can uh, we s still say that the actions that they are doing are the actions of a NATO member, or we can say that it's actually independent actions of uh, an independent state in that context. I'm asking this because uh, it's uh, interesting how the uh, how Article Five of NATO will function in that case. So, say uh, the NATO member asks. Uh, uh, some kind of an assistance from other NATO members for actions that uh, th this state has done as uh, where it's uh, maintaining its own int national interest and something that doesn't have actually uh, a relationship with uh, NATO and its mission and functions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is very, very relevant uh, question. But let me come back uh, to my uh, explanation and uh, my initial, initial thoughts. Uh, in the EU, we have uh, you know, transfer of sovereignty. So uh, when countries become part of EU, EU member countries, they give to the common bodies part of their sovereignty. This means that uh, common bodies can decide on behalf uh, of countries. Of course, it is limited competence. It is limited by the treaties. But still, uh, European Commission uh, or uh, uh, Council, they, they can decide and their decisions uh, can be imposed on countries. So this is transfer of sovereignty. There is no such transfer of sovereignty within NATO. Uh, the decisions within NATO are taken by countries and by respective representatives. It can be uh, uh, diplomats sitting in, uh, in Brussels, or it can be ministers of defense, or it can be ministers of foreign affairs, or we have summits uh, with participation of head of states. These bodies, they take all decisions. NATO's authorities cannot take decisions and to impose them on individual nations. In other words, if there is a uh, proposed decision and only one country, let's say Bulgaria or Turkey, because uh, we discussed Turkey and it, it happened very, uh, very quite, quite often, even if only country is against this decision, it cannot become a decision of NATO. So this is, this is the key difference between uh, NATO and European Union. So that, that means uh, that uh, sometimes uh, individual interests of individual countries prevails over common interests. And NATO, NATO uh, provides a platform for discussions. All countries are sitting together, discussing different issues, discussing different approaches, discussing different uh, uh, NATO for NATO missions, for example, when when uh, there is an agreement that NATO should act as an organization, and if all countries agree, you know, it it can become a NATO operation or NATO decision or, or whatever. Let me remind you, uh, uh, the, the 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 conflict in Iraq. 
2003, uh, United States asked NATO to, uh, to launch a NATO, NATO as an organization, NATO operation uh, in Iraq. In several countries said, no, we are not going there. Uh, France, uh, Germany, and some others opposed. That's why Americans, they said, okay, it is our interest to go uh, in Iraq. I'm not saying it's, uh, uh, um, it's right or bad decision, but I'm just saying how, how in practice uh, uh, the, 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 uh, this was implemented. So NATO as an organization said, no. Uh, that's why Americans said, okay, we'll go there. We'll create a coalition of willing countries who would like to join us. So participation in uh, operation in Iraq was a decision of each individual country which sent forces there, but not NATO. And uh, again, uh, it, is, it is difficult. Uh, I mean, we hope, we hope that NATO won't be blocked if uh, a NATO member country is threatened or even attacked uh, by other country or organization or terrorist groups uh, or even individuals. Because by the way, uh, NATO considers attack under Article 5, not, not only attack by conventional forces, it can be a, uh, a cyber attack. So NATO can assist uh, each uh, of its member states to cope with, uh, with the cyber attacks or terrorist attacks. Actually, the operation in Afghanistan was uh, launched uh, uh, after uh, the, the clause of Article uh, 5 was uh, enforced uh, uh, after, uh, after the attacks uh, uh, of 9-11. So this, is, this would be my, uh, my answer to your question. Thank you very much. We have two more questions. The first one is from uh, Valentina uh, Shebetovska. I, I really hope that I say the name right. Okay. Try to unmute. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, once again, thank you for your uh, talk. It was uh, indeed really interesting. So I want to ask you, in your opinion, can Europe allow itself to be more independent on the international arena? And uh, what is Europe going to win out of this independence, if possible, to achieve, uh, as there will be resources resources needed for its defense, for example? Uh, I couldn't. Uh, uh, I couldn't take your question uh, because the, 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 there was an in interruption of the communication. Okay. Uh, who, 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 who should uh, be independent? Uh, so the yeah. question is, in your opinion. Can Europe allow itself to be more independent? Aha, Europe, okay. Yeah, on the international arena. Uh, what is Europe going to win out of this independence uh, if it is possible to achieve it? As uh, there will be resources needed for uh, its defense, for example. Uh, first, first, Europe wants to be more independent. First, first, Europe wants to be more active. Uh, Europe uh, wants to be a bigger security provider in the world. And actually, Europe is providing a lot of, uh, you know, efforts uh, and uh, provides um, uh, a lot of uh, for creating security in, in different parts of the world. Uh, for example, Europe uh, is the biggest donor uh, of international cooperation uh, in, in, in different uh, countries. For example, uh, Europe now provides a lot of uh, food and assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, Europe provides a lot of resources uh, uh, to Middle East, to Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The issue is, the issue is uh, whether Europe will be able to be more security provider in terms providing hard security. So uh, in case, for example, if there is a military conflict to send European military troops uh, uh, or to, to, uh, to tackle different issues uh, through, uh, through military means. 
this is this is this is the biggest challenge uh, and the answer differs uh, depending which country which european country you ask for uh, for example some countries uh, would like to see europe more independent and more independent actor uh, from nato like france like germany but mainly france uh, um, if you if you read uh, Macron's uh, you know ideas of uh, European um, uh, intervention initiative, uh, you clearly see that uh, he would like to see Europe acting as independent uh, military actor. But uh, most of uh, European countries uh, they're afraid of decoupling decoupling Europe from NATO. Because, as I said, most of the European countries are members of both unions. They cannot simply afford to, to, to build forces. Uh, this, this part uh, of my forces will be for NATO. This part will be for the European Union. So that, that's why the idea is uh, how to find this ratio, how to find the role of uh, European Union uh, within NATO when it comes, again, to European defense, but also countries are trying to find the role of uh, European Union to cope with different challenges. Being on European territory, for example, my migration, terrorism, hyper threats, uh, disinformation, um, uh, uh, coping with organized crime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what will be the role of Europe uh, in Africa, in Middle East, uh, or in, in any other uh, other places. So again, this is this is right now under discussions. Uh, uh, and you will see there is there is still no unanimity within European Union. But definitely the goal is to have European Union uh, uh, more active in uh, uh, solving different types of crises, more capable. Uh, uh, which, uh, of course, will, will require a lot of resources. Thank you. And one more, one more question from uh, Beatrice Bidova. Uh, yes, thank you, first of all, for this report. Uh, my question is actually considering France presidency uh, of the Council of the European Union for uh, this year. Actually, already um, President Macron published um, France uh, plan called Recovery, Power and Belonging. It's very, <laughs> very nice name, I, I guess. And it's um, actually how France presidency is about to create, um, it's about to contribute to the creation of the EU army, which I, I guess is like France <laughs> dream for always. And to what extent uh, this politics of France correlates with NATO security policy? It's very interesting. You have an um, answer to this question. It's, um, yeah, <laughs> it's now on our agenda. Thank you. Yeah, you, you are right. Uh, France would like to see Europe more capable of acting militarily. France would like to see Europe more independent from NATO. France uh, would probably like to see Europe more independent from uh, United States. So uh, for this end, uh, France is uh, pushing uh, uh, towards uh, creation of common European structures, uh, developing um, uh, common European capabilities. But, but I'm... I'm sure that this is impossible at this stage of development of the European Union to create common European army. Like in NATO, NATO doesn't have army. Uh, NATO forces uh, are composed of uh, armed forces of uh, different members. The same will be for Europe. If Europe would like to uh, act militarily as an union, uh, European Union should rely on common structures, but also on the armies of individual countries. It is impossible, it is impossible to create uh, a common army. Uh, and also very important, um, you know, to, to, to have 
to have uh, um, European operations, let's say, we need to have, uh, of course, capabilities, which means uh, real, real military forces. Uh, I'll remind you in 2011, uh, under the initiative of France, uh, European Union launched an operation in Libya. Uh, and it uh, proved that Europe does not have enough resources, military resources. Just in uh, three, four days, uh, Europe uh, discovered that it uh, needs more um, precise, uh, uh, precision weapons. It needs more resources for, uh, you know, command and control, and it uh, needs intelligence. So Europe asked the United States to provide this. Uh, for this European uh, operation. So again, if Europe would like uh, to be more independent, European countries should do more, should invest more in their own armies. But to have a common operation, you don't, you, you need not only uh, resources, but you need also a common understanding that Europe should go this or, uh, or there or to take uh, this or that uh, mission. And here comes uh, one very difficult um, uh, issue for Europe. There is different uh, security culture in different countries. So one countries uh, are more prone to go outside. Uh, countries uh, uh, like France, like Netherlands, like Belgium, they take much more easily decision to send troops abroad. Other countries like Germany, uh, like, like Bulgaria or, uh, or, or Hungary, uh, they are more hesitant. So it, it is, again, um, a difficult uh, process. Uh, de definitely, there is a, a willingness to go in, in this direction of creating uh, or making Europe more capable and making Europe a bigger security provider. Um, and uh, here comes to my mind another issue. If you take, if you take current uh, discussions uh, between Russia and United States, Russia and NATO, discussions within OEC, there is one missing, and it's European Union. So, uh, you know, United States, uh, NATO are discussing European security, but European Union is missing. So. Uh, it's not only about, uh, you know, willingness of organization. It's not only about willingness of European Union to do something. It is also acceptance. If other forces, if other countries, uh, other organizations accept Europe as this security provider, as this player, player on this ground. So uh, Europe has to prove that uh, it, is, it is a player, that it can contribute. Um, but it's again long, long process. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question from the call from the host. Uh, well, we all know that NATO and Russia and the European Union and Russia are in let's call it a tough period in our re relations. Uh, is it possible in the near future to appear something like Ukraine 2.0. To be more precise, I'm talking about the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, we see that, unfortunately, the nationalists are returning there. Uh, even some experts, experts, they predict that there is not going to be more, uh, th th we're going to see uh, the end of the federation. And even uh, Murad Dodik announced, if I'm not mistaken, in the summer that the federation is already dead, that Bosnia-Herzegovina is no, no more a country. So uh, is it possible for NATO, for the European Union and Russia to cooperate together because we all, uh, we all see the, the need for security in, on the Balkan region, or unfortunately, we will witness something like a new conflict in Europe. I think we will see both. I think we will see both. Uh, 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 first, unfortunately, uh, there is a mistrust uh, between NATO and Russia and between uh, European Union and, and Russia. Uh, in order to start uh, uh, cooperation on, on different issues, you have to solve the, this issue of, uh, you know, lack of trust. 
uh, NATO and Europe are suspicious uh, about Russian activities, especially after 2008 and 2014. Um, this, is, this is the issue uh, which has to be addressed. And the only place to be addressed is uh, on the negotiation table. So I think that uh, what we'll see uh, in the close future, at least, uh, we'll see um, uh, um, probably an agreement on some confidence building measures uh, in order to reduce tension. So uh, uh, this is this is uh, one 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 issue which uh, which seems to me very important uh, to try to uh, to, to to first uh, uh, to try to find uh, uh, common issues on which countries can agree and uh, cooperate, and of course uh, to increase the trust. This is, uh, this is uh, one issue. Uh, of course, uh, Russia and NATO and Russia and European Union uh, 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 will be on different positions uh, on, on many issues. Uh, simply the interests, uh, as I see, are, are, are different. Even, uh, even on, uh, on, on, on the Balkans, uh, I, I think uh, Russia does not share the same approach uh, like the European Union uh, and United States. Um, regarding regarding uh, Bosnia and, and, and Herzegovina, um, no, nationalism never gone from, from the Balkans. It was there from the very beginning. Uh, it was there for centuries. Um, unfortunately, now we see this rise of nationalism, we can, which can trigger different, different conflict. And uh, uh, it is very, very peculiar issue with, with Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, it, it never been, um, you know, a really functioning uh, single state. Um, but if, if, uh, if we will see uh, Bosnia splitting in different parts, if we see uh, Republika Srpska, you know, separating from Bosnia and uh, aligning with, uh, with Serbia, it may trigger uh, unpredictable processes. I mean, there are so many nationalism, there are so many unresolved conflicts that if, uh, if separation will start again, uh, we'll come back uh, to the 90s. Uh, dissolutions of uh, different countries, uh, ethnical uh, conflicts, religion probably uh, conflict. So that that that's why for for the time being, at least, it is important to keep um, to keep Bosnia as uh, uh, <laughs> as a, as a country within the current borders. Let 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 me put it this way, because uh, um, I don't I don't see any improvements uh, you know in uh, in uh, in construction of uh, unit uh, united state uh, i mean it will continue functioning uh, as as it is now but at least in order to prevent tensions in order to prevent conflicts uh, uh, bosnia should be kept uh, within uh, its its current borders uh, whether uh, eu and russia and nato and russia can cooperate uh, um, I'm not sure on this particular issue, but uh, Russia and NATO, Russia and U European Union can cooperate on many other issues, like terrorism, like climate change, uh, like uh, you know coping with the situation uh, in uh, Afghanistan uh, and some other countries. Um, so this is, uh, I I would say, um, areas uh, for for potential cooperation. Ukraine, unfortunately, is not uh, is not an issue for cooperation. I I, I think that uh, you know on on the table of discussion, uh, it is only uh, you know how to stop uh, uh, a bigger conflict. This is uh, this is uh, probably the most uh, important. And after that, uh, to establish uh, probably new measures uh, which which will decrease tension and to which uh, will create uh, trust uh, and, and, and confidence. Actually, I participated many years ago uh, in, uh, in different formats uh, uh, in, in the Black Sea region where we cooperated uh, with, with Russia and other uh, 
Black Sea countries. We exchanged information. Uh, there, there were really uh, confidence building measures mechanisms. Now they are not functioning. So we, we have to try to reestablish. Uh, we have to come at least to, to the understanding that uh, uh, military conflicts, uh, it's not an option. Uh, and uh, uh, we should come to, to, to the decision and to understanding uh, that uh, principles which were established back in 1975, in 1990, uh, uh, should, be, should be respected and uh, implemented. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure to host you and talk about NATO in the European Union. I think it was a very interesting gathering. Uh, I want especially to thank to our speaker today, Redan Bujulov, who accepted our invitation and, uh, and, and, meet, and met with us. Uh, thank you all for participating and for your questions. And I hope to see you soon on our third seminar that is actually going to be uh, in two weeks. Uh, on 27th of, this, of uh, uh, January, uh, where we're going to talk with the Middle East journalist, uh, Ruslan Trat, and uh, we're going to talk about the place of the Middle East countries uh, in EU agenda. So uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you for having me. It was uh, really indeed uh, a great discussion. If you have any questions, you can find my email on our website. So please uh, ask questions, make comments. Uh, I am available. And good luck. Thank you very much.